a picture of Otto by Ted Hughes. You stand there at the blackboard, Lutheran Minister Monke, your idea of heaven and earth and hell radically modified by the honeybees commune. A big shock for so much of your Prussian backbone, as can be conjured into poetry, to find yourself so tangled with me, rising from your coffin. A big shock to meet me face to face in the dark adit, where I have come looking for your daughter. You have assumed this tunnel, your family vault. I never dreamed how occult our guilt. Your ghost inseparable from my shadow, as long as your daughter's words can stir a candle. She could hardly tell us apart in the end. Your portrait here could be my son's portrait. I understand. You never could have released her. I was a whole myth too late to replace you. This underworld, my friend, is her heart's home. Inseparable, here we must remain, everything forgiven and in common. Not that I see her behind you, where I face you, but like Owen, after his dark poem, under the battle, in the catacomb, sleeping with the German as if alone. This poem speaks directly to Sylvia Plath's daddy, and we can see that in the first line, you stand here at the blackboard, um, and Hughes is mimicking Plath's style and even you know, basically borrowing the line, you stand at the blackboard, daddy, in the picture I have of you. So he's imitating her style of poetry uh, and he's doing this deliberately as a way for him to be able to um, make a conversation occur between the two poems. You'll also notice um, that the poem begins with the word, the pronoun you, and the device is apostrophe. So Hughes is addressing the ghost of Otto, Sylvia's father. And You'll notice also that in the title that Hughes gives him a name where, where Plath didn't. And what this does is it personalises Otto and it presents a different image of him. So what Hughes is attempting to do is present uh, a perspective of um, Otto, uh, of, of Plath's father, that's going to collide with the um, image that, that Plath has created in her poetry. And what that will allow us to do is to be able to think about those bigger ideas. So once we move past the personal politics of the, the, the personalities, we can start looking at bigger ideas about perspective, about representation and about truth. And we'll come to the conclusion that, that, um, that there's too much of a complexity to have an absolute truth. And so this poem, through the conversation that it strikes up with, um, with Daddy, with but also with other Plath poems, and also with uh, you know other Hughes poems, um, we um, we we start to see that there there's no absolute truth, and that, that that's what is you know enduring about this poetry, and what invites us as a modern audience or as modern readers into the the poem. So um, Otto was um, training to be a Lutheran minister. But he decided that it wasn't for him, and and he became an entomologist. So he he um, had you know began that study and had an occupation working with bees, and the honey bees commune I think is a really nice way of looking at his interest in the life of bees and the goings on and the workings of bees. So in this line, your idea of heaven and earth and hell radically modified by the honey bees commune. So. Um, you know, the, the ideas of heaven and hell and the preoccupation of death is pushed aside um, and he embraces life. And Hughes really constructs an image of Otto that's that's completely different to, to Plath's just in this um, notion. Plath was preoccupied with death, fixated with it, but her father wasn't, is, is Hughes's um, perspective. And he... Um, does a number of things in this poem to unite both um, Otto and himself. So, like he says in the sh in the shot and in another uh, other poems, it was a big shock to have this occur. You know, for you know, um, you know, in the shot he basically says he was young and naive, and and it wasn't until Plath had passed straight through him and the, 
that the, that the events had occurred that he realised what had happened. And and so I think that um, Hughes is saying that, that Otto Otto's experience is exactly the same. A big shock for so much of your Prussian backbone as can be conjured into poetry. So first of all, you know, he's, a, he's suggesting that he has a, a real, uh, he's a real strong character um, and that, that Plath has conjured an image of him. So it's, it's a work of magic. It's not real. And, and then he says that, um, you know, Otto finds himself so tangled with me rising from your coffin. So here, he, you know, he is saying that, that, um, that the image and the idea of Otto and of Ted Hughes are the same, that they're intertwined and they're inseparable and that you can't, you can't prize them apart. Um, and that there is an inexplicable link between the two. And so we can look at that when we move beyond the, the personal and say, well, really, he's talking about the gender and that there was a, a, um, a, a conflict between um, gender in, in class poems and, and this is what Hughes is exploring as well. So he says, it was a big shock to meet me face to face in the dark at it. Now, an adit is a, a passageway. It's like a small tunnel that leads you into the mine. And, and so this is um, uh, another motif that he borrows from Plast poetry. If you think about Nick and the Candlestick, for example, where um, Plast says she's a miner and that she's, you know, like moving through that tunnel. And so Hughes here is saying that he, he meets Otto in, in this passageway. And um, and so he's saying that his poem is the um, the entity that allows the conversation to occur between the poems. So this poem is meant to be a way of mining for truth, and it's a conduit between between the two. Okay, and and so it's quite clever how Hughes is is presenting that and just reshaping these ideas that the poetry he's saying is a means by which we can. We can have this ongoing discourse. And I never dreamed how occult our guilt, your ghost inseparable from my shadow. Uh, um, he he's saying that he you know that that um, that the perspective and the perception that's created by Plath is mythical. That's not true, and that um, that they are they are united. As I said, they're inseparable. Is repeated. Um, and the personal pr pronouns we see um, of Otto and Hughes here are uh, indicating that there is um, eternal guilt and blame apportioned to them by Plath and that not only um, was it uh, relevant and pertinent in the 60s when she wrote her poetry, but, but it still endures today and that they, they suffer as a result of, of the uh, poetry. Okay, um, and then your ghost inseparable from my shadows. He's saying that they are it's a continuation of this idea of them being entwined. And, you know, he, I think it's a really nice image, isn't it, that he's a ghostly apparition and, and Hughes is a shadow of his former self. You know, um, that's not about the physicality that's been taken from him. As long as your daughter's words can stir a candle. So here, you know, it's he, Hughes is saying that, that Plath's poetry has had such an impact um, and it's caused such um, condemnation of, of both Otto and Hughes and painted them as demonic and, um, you know, uh, as um, destructive sort of characters, really powerful characters. Um, and, and so Hughes is, Hughes is saying that her poetry is... Um, it is a um, conjuration. It's it's been here's that word there. It's been constructed by her, and it's really a myth. Your ghost inseparable from my shadow, as long as your words can stir a candle. She could hardly tell us apart in the end. So here we've got um, the oppositional pronouns. Here it's sort of like an us and them mentality um, being presented, where um, it, it's impersonal, and I think. The idea is to to see that there is a a, um, a a conflict between genders, you know, that she representing females and us representing 
uh, men, you know, and 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 it's really this line she could hardly tell us apart in the end is suggesting that that um, they are all treated the same that that they they're, they're um, placed in in a um, in a box almost where they where they're um, defined by generalized characteristics. And then the next line's an interesting one. Your portrait here could be my son's portrait. So um, saying that not only are Otto and Ted similar, but, but Nick is as well. Nick, um, she's saying that the image of you in your photo is could be the same as Nick, that they're physically very similar. So that suggests that, um, that he too is just like the, um, the, the father and the grandfather. And what Hughes is doing here is he's challenging Plath's uh, assertion that, that Nick was nurturing and a saviour where the older men weren't. They were more destructive. And so the, Hughes is reshaping that, that notion that, that, um, that, that there is a uh, distinction between the two and, in fact, that Nick is just like Ted, who's just like Otto, that they're all the same and um, they're, they all, it, it sort of positions us to see both Otto and Hughes in a, in a um, more humane and, um, you know, passive light, I suppose. I understand, and then there's a dash, so we, we're, we're meant to pause there. So he, Hughes is, is um, you know, showing a bit of empathy and really positioning um, the representation of Otto so that we see him as a victim too. You never could have released her. So really I've written down here that Otto is powerless to health Plathy too, which is a much softer image of him compared to other poems where um, he's really often presented uh, you know, compared to um, a Nazi torturer, you know, which is quite extreme. And Hughes is saying, well, he's just as powerless. He doesn't have the power that, that Plath is, is um, placing upon him. Um, and, and so there is doubt and, and Hughes is uh, allowing us to, to, to look at things from a different perspective. I was a whole myth too late to replace you. So that's that notion that, um, and it's coming from the shot, I think, that, that Plath had already constructed the myth of um, male oppression and uh, those type of things, and, and that, that, um, that when Hughes came around, that had already been constructed. He was too late. So he's sort of powerless in that sense too. This underworld, my friend, is her heart's home. So in other poems, we... Um, we know that the underworld is an allusion to suffering. It's you know a personal hell, so it has that religious uh, allusion, religious undertone, um, and and so first and foremost, he's saying that suffering was Sylvia's heart's home. The alliteration there indicates that 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 she was fixated on on suffering and and her own death. And, and he's also saying that, that um, they too share that. And he, he speaks to him in very endearing terms because they're united in the situation that they're in and that Plath lived in this world of suffering, but so too did Hughes and Otto. And that, that um, he says then, inseparable, here we must remain. So their suffering has, endures. So maybe he's suggesting that Plath um, she finds an escape and freedom in, from her suffering, yet Hughes and Otto, theirs endures. And Hughes in particular, while still alive, um, has that eternal suffering. Um, and, and he does that in silence, as we know, until he, he um, releases the, the, the birthday letters. So everything forgiven and in common. Not that I see her behind you where I face you, so basically this um, seems to be um, conversing with the shot as well to say that, you know, when the bullet passes through Hughes, he turns around to see Otto, but 
Plath is not there, and the suggestion is that she's passed through him as well, had the same impact on Otto as she has had on Hughes, and that she's gone. And then, but like Owen, after his dark poem, under the battle in the catacomb, sleeping with his German as if alone. So he's really saying that, like Wilfred Owen, the poet, Plath is now sleeping with his German as if alone. And the German, obviously, is Otto, and we can say that Plath is now at peace. She's sleeping um, as if they're alone, and that, that's, that's all that's important in their realm. So uh, we have these images of death. So under the battle, so under the ground in that, you know, in that space, in the tomb, in the catacomb, and, and this image of sleep being, uh, you know, a, a motif for death as well, and that death unites, they're united in death. Now, we need to talk about Wilfred Owen's poem. He wrote this poem called Strange Meeting, and, you know, a British soldier meets the German soldiers that he had killed, and the, the, the idea is that... Um, that when they are dead, whilst whilst alive they're they're enemies, and when they're dead, they they they're united. And so um, Hughes is um, using that intertextual reference to um, draw that straw, stronger statement about about um, the the freedom that that um, Plath achieves, and that he's really saying that oh, this last line, I think has this really peaceful tone. There's a, a sense that, that um, death, uh, 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 you know, is uh, the means by which Plath achieves freedom and peace. Um, and, you know, what that does is, is it, it um, you know, presents this idea that Hughes and, and Otto have sacrificed themselves and by their suffering, by their continued suffering, their suffering enables Plath to become free. Okay, and and so when we look on a a, a um, broader level, we can look and if we look at it from a gender perspective, and say that men men by remaining um, um, viewed in the light that they are they are able to um, provide women with the, the pathway to freedom. So I don't know if I've explained that too well, but um, I think that the bigger picture is that that um, <clears throat> that in this gendered war, not war, but in, in this um, conflict between gender, Hughes is saying that, that men will endure the, the hardship and the suffering I don't know if I've expressed that well either, but they'll endure so that women can achieve um, their own freedom. So the poem is is a very interesting one because it does allow for that ongoing discourse and essentially by representing Otto in this manner, what it does is it allows us to draw bigger conclusions about perception about representation and about truth and coming to that conclusion that that there are no absolute truths and that um, all perceptions are complex.